This is Cassian, back focusing on oasification. So this is a podcast two on this subject. So today I thought I'd um, sport one of my other tartan ties. This is actually the um, official tartan for the Australian military. This is based on the colours of Ayers Rock. Sometimes you may see diggers sporting kilts in this tartan at memorial sites playing bagpipes. Yeah, there's the Celt in us, going back to the Indo-Europeans. But let's get back to the trees. In this session, I will discuss subject larger trees, their status and treatment. Let's go walk. So coming to our trees, in actual fact, there are three subject trees here. To the left is a young Mary. More or less centre to this video is the is a Mary I'm going to talk about treating next, but it's a field pasture tree, you know, um, a few decades old, some decades old. And then we have our large fellow, you know, this, this tree is um, certainly a king of this piece of land. And uh, again, I marvel at the lower canopy that this tree is producing as a part of its adaption into becoming a field pasture tree. So here we, here we have our two subject trees. We have our, our young Mary gum just to the left and then um our older tree i mean nowhere near middle age still still really you know a late teenager really but anyway this uh, what i want to draw your attention to is you know look at the color signature of the young mary look at the foliage and then then look at the color signature of the the older mary gum and you'll see there's a variation i mean young trees like young people young animals you know we're programmed with vitality. You know, even if we don't have the um, resources necessary, our youthfulness carries us through. Yeah, I mean, in the case of trees, as trees get older, there's a greater need for their associate organisms to help deliver the elements they need. You know, this is below ground. So just walking in, I'm gonna focus on the foliage. Okay, you can see that coloration. You can see the sort of density of canopy. Yeah, it's an indicator. Let's go compare. So again, walking in to our subject. And you can see a lot more sparsity in the foliage. You know, you can see dieback in the twigs. And incidentally, you know, I'm going to just discuss the term dieback. Don't confuse that with Phytophthora. You know, dieback exists in trees for a whole variety of reasons. Phytophthora is a, a disease which causes dieback. In some ways, it was a mistake to label Phytophthora as dieback. Yes, it causes dieback, but there are many reasons why. And we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be sidetracked. So dieback is a stress response. And here we are again, you know, the discoloration that I've discussed, in, you know, of, of recent times, you know, talking about these are the symptoms of Mary canker. It's a disease which has been isolated, it has been, it has been named. Um, but as I'm going to keep pointing out in my tree casts, you know, canker is a stress response. And the stress response is because of desertification below ground, a lack of association, you know, competition from turf grasses, you know, the use of herbicides, you know, these all add up to causing stress for trees. And with regards to the phytophthora issue, the canker issue, any of the diseases, they are all symptoms of another problem. Now, as a result of the canker, this tree does have problems. I am fairly certain that with treatment, the health of the tree can be bolstered and the tree can be encouraged to lay down new wood. But this, this tree does have issues in the form of, you know, like decay, which has spread from a lesion from the canker into a buttress root. You know, that, that has ramifications on stability in storm events. And then coming up the tree, we can see, you know, we've got two codolent stems, yeah, and a fork between those stems. 
and you know there is evidence of a, of the lesion running up the tree and coming adjacent to that fork so in essence you know the canker is 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 weakening is weakening those tissues and the tree you know, is responding you know like you can see this exudation that's known as kino and that's the tree's response it is, is producing this as a way to try and offset the effects of the canker we can see a snag here you know this was from a, a limb failure yeah you know, that limb failure may well have been associated with being weakened by the canker coming around the other side of the tree you know this is this is better this is better right? you, you have a lot of a lot more connectivity between tissues that haven't been affected by the canker but then you can see you can see the lesions that are breaking out you know again one which is running into a buttress root you know there's a lesion there too in actual fact if we film around the um the root you can see you know there's an open wound on this side which is leading into the decayed buttress root we discussed before but you can also tr see that the tree is laying down wood that is growth response and given sufficient vitality the tree will actually occlude that injury and i've seen cankered trees you know virtually come back from the dead but that is subject to vitality that is subject to health and this tree is operating on a minus because of the desertification. So coming back to the impacted side, assuming that I was able to arrest the canker disease by boosting the health of the tree, there are steps that could be taken to help the tree to optimize this situation. Now, knowing Mary gums as being exceptional phoenix trees, I have no doubt that given the vitality, a tree such as this would occlude and close those injuries. I have no doubt that the tree would compartmentalize any decay from within. But, you know, first and foremost, we've got to get the health back to the tree. While I'm on this discussion point, I will acknowledge this fork. Forks such as this can be supported, can be supported by, by inducing natural grafts between the forks. This is a subject I'll, I'll discuss later, later in my tree cast series as I find uh, examples of this in nature. I'd just like to add that I have a very substantial body of work on a canker disease that I assessed on the east coast of Australia, outside of the range of Mary canker. Um, this canker disease in question has a lot of parallels to this particular canker disease. The issue over east is we don't have a biosecurity initiative which enables funding. I attach my past professional report on the disease I named canker syndrome this being to enable a greater understanding on what constitutes a canker disease. This will be attached to this video under the description. You know, standing back from the tree and just, you know, considering those defective components I've discussed. I mean, I don't, I don't like to use the term defects, you know, because trees naturally optimize such. I, I refer to these as mechanical constraints, but with those mechanical constraints in mind, you know, let's step back, let's look at the upper canopy, let's look at the overall tree. You know, this, this tree s still is likely to stand up to wind events for some years. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I have time to help support this tree to make um, the kind of recovery that our forest giant has with reclaiming, generating a new, a new crown beneath the old forest crown. Just to add, based on this tree's short height, field pasture crown and capacity, I would invest in it by oasifying its growing environment. And just considering the oasification side of the story, I'd like to discuss this, this paddock tree is a good example with some good indicators. But you know, here we can see the shadow of the tree. The sun's high, so the shadow of the tree is, is cast to its actual drip line. And so if I was to treat a tree like this, if I was to look at restoring its growing environment, you know, I would be treating from the trunk extending out to two to three meters beyond that shadow, creating a large oval, you know, or a large circle, if you like, um, which would be a, a nutrient bed and the soil beneath that, I would be 
treating with vertical fissures. You can see the shadow outlines with the three trees. These could all be treatment zones. We could even join these three treatment zones together and make one large nutrient bed. That's the term I describe under the description. So if I was to treat this tree, I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but because it's a much larger scale, you know, so I'm going to be going, okay, well, we'll make a soil moat because it's so desertified here. A small soil moat really helps a berm. You know, sometimes they're called swales. Sometimes you can just do half berms or you can do a series of half berms and they really help with staging water. You know, this land was recently subjected to a, to a major rain and most of it just ran off the surface. And that's because of soil compaction. By using berms or swales, we help to stagger the water into the ground. And, and with aerating the soil, um, that, you know, the, the water penetrates. You know, the berms and the aeration go together. So, you know, I, I, would, I would go to two to three meters beyond the grip line of this tree, you know, and, and make a large circle. And um, I would, on a larger scale, I'm not just de decompacting with a fork. I'm, I'm making vertical fissures with uh, machinery, which will be discussed in a future podcast. Uh, and then, you know, it's at times that I will be filling those fissures with with a, a carbon rich compost. And, and you know, I like to make fissures every square meter. You know, I like, I mean, every square meter, even three fissures, and then perhaps another three fissures with um, planting tube stock as companion planting. But in the space of, you know, carry, carrying out the aeration, aeration, which is the combination of vertical fissures and hand forking, planting, um, you know, you're, you're setting it up. And yes, there is a bit of cost in outlaying the resources, the materials, you know, to treat an area like this. You know, it may well be, you know, like a, an oval or a circle. Um, you know, like the meterage could be 20 by 20 meters, you know. But once that treatment is done, and then I like to cap my treated areas with, with logs. I use log rounds, I use stones, and the purpose of those is to, um, to cap the mulch layer, which goes on top, and to essentially make pathways and walkways for maintenance to get into the site, because I don't want to recompact the site by walking around on it. With consideration of the cost of time and resources, to create and maintain a large scale nutrient bed, we need to consider the benefit. In such a case, the benefit may well be an extra 100 years life expectancy for the tree. To add to the overall construction of a nutrient bed, the materials themselves go a long way to helping hold soil moisture. Though it's the activation of the fungi that really hold the water. This can be for a period of months as compared to a desertified soil environment. Um, you know, you walk over soil you've treated, you'll recompact it with your feet, especially with repetitious movements. But by making multiple pathways of cut log rounds, um, the weight is dissipated and you, you can make vertical fissures under the log rounds, which you'll get rooting into. And so you'll get columns of rooting sitting on the logs, which happens in, in nature, you know. You, you know, I mean, you'll, you'll have whole logs full of brown rot decay, which become an above ground resource for fibrous roots of trees. You know, like it's, uh, it's, it's fairly basic in nature, but we have to mimic it. And to mimic nature requires paying attention to her and switching off some of the narrative that we're told. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot in horticulture and there's even a measure, there's a measure in the boroculture, which is old school and, you know, we need to move move forwards from. I mean, this is really the premise for conservation of boroculture. So in closing on this session, I, um, I felt the need to go over a little bit of old ground by looking at some of the symptoms that go with desertification. So our, our subject tree, you know, looking at the canker, looking at some of those issues that the tree has, recognizing there's a problem which needs to be fixed in essence. And, you know, drawing on the model that nature gives is really the heart and soul of nature culture. That's, that's the gift that I've observed and that's what I'm seeking to share with the world. In part three, we'll be looking at resources that assist the process of oasification and comparing those to resources that 
a mainstream that aren't quite as useful.